Great. Um, so Marco did an awesome job of introducing ourselves, uh, both of us. So uh, I'm going to try and skip that. But anyhow, welcome and good morning to everyone. Hopefully, the next uh, 30 minutes or so, you will find what we're going to share with you interesting. All I can tell you is, is it was a definitely an interesting journey for both Dieter and myself. Um, interestingly, our, I mean, our organization is large, but Dieter and I, since we were kind of at the forefront of what the customers really need, hence both of us are on stage, because his team kind of played an equal part in the setup of uh, this platform. And with that, then, I will have Dieter kind of introduce himself. If you want to, or we can actually skip the slide because really we've, it's already been covered. So move to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So also from my side, welcome. And uh, thanks for actually stealing our introduction, but perfect. So before we start um, uh, and get into the topic, maybe two words about Bayer, the company we are working for. So Bayer is a global life science company. Um, as you can see, we are working in more than 80 countries, um, having around about 100,000 employees. And with our three divisions, crop sciences, pharmaceuticals, and consumer health, we are striving to realize our mission, health for all and hunger for none. And um, I personally find this really cool because that is tackling two of the most pressing um, topics that we have in today's world, which, which is um, health and nutrition. Okay, um, what are Nachman and I doing in Bayer? So we are working in the enabling functions IT. So what is the enabling functions? Um, I think in other companies you would typically call it, typically call it um, corporate functions. So for us, this is the cross-divisional functions like finance, supply chain, procurement, HR, um, LPC, and some, other, some others more. Um, the first challenge with this is that this is a very, a very heterogeneous environment. So we have 15 different functions that we are serving. Uh, and obviously, all of them are super different, right? So they have all different requirements and need to be treated in a special way. So what are we as enabling functions IT doing to um, support these enabling functions? Um, our strategy and our mission is to make the enabling functions faster, leaner, more flexible, and value-driven. And we are doing this by making our processes more effective with enhanced decision making. Um, we want to make the, the processes more efficient um, through simplification and intelligent automation. And last but not least, we want to improve like, the user experience of our processes. Um, so what you, what you immediately recognize here is that for these three points, you need to basically two things. This is digital technologies like machine learning, IoT, depending on the function that we are talking about. And obviously, you need data, right? And this is what Nachman and I are responsible for. Um, we are creating the data assets and providing it to our consumers. <coughs> Sorry. So when you look at our existing data and system landscape, what, is, what was the challenge before we started the build of our cloud data platform? So, not a surprise, our enabling functions data assets were locked in on-premise technology, right? So, and I think I don't need to explain the first point that this means a lack of scalability. Just imagine um, um, in our case that there is a group of decision scientists trying to do a machine learning directly on the business warehouse, right? So the admins of the business warehouse will yeah, have the sweat on their faces. Um, therefore, I think this point is, is quite obvious. But also, we have a lack of connectivity here, because the systems, like the transactional systems that we are talking about, um, the satellite systems of that, um, our business warehouse, they don't really offer like these modern, cool interfaces like APIs that you need to um, enable these digital technologies to work. And as a last point, we, have, like, a, we, we saw a lack of flexibility, right? So, a low grade of automation in the deployments, in deployments of changes, and in fulfilling solutions and implementing these, right? Taking all of this together, you would probably say, hey, well, super, that's easy. Just take your entire business warehouse thing and migrate it to the cloud, right? Um, we thought about that, actually, in the beginning, um, but there are some complications. So first of all, we are not starting on a green field. And in our case, 
This means in the existing systems, first and foremost, our business warehouse, we have high maturity data assets that have been built over the last years with massive investments. To rebuild and re-architect these in a new cloud platform would be a tremendous effort, right? Moreover, um, these data assets are already used in many, many applications. So there are many dependencies to existing processes and so on. Um, I'm just mentioning uh, some examples here. Our business warehouse is the financial leading system. It is the foundation of the group reporting. Do we, without any need, really want to fully migrate that to a new tech stack? Hmm. Maybe. Um, then third point, some of our functions are really data heavy and the experience shows that we are bringing each and every system to its boundaries and limits. Um, so Nachman will give you some figures later on um, what we are talking about here, but just as an example, we have tables um, that are billions of records long, thousands of columns broad and receive hundreds of thousands of updates daily. Um, so this is really massive and we have a, a huge number of these tables, right? So really, really big. Um, and we, have, we are hitting boundaries probably not uh, in the sense of storage and so on, but really in the processing of it, right? So we need to do real-time processing um, and this usually is a problem. Um, last point is that we also need to be honest that um, you will find features in a business warehouse that you don't find out of the box in cl cloud technology, right? So one example would be simple things like currency conversion. Yeah, a business warehouse exactly knows how to do it. It's pre-built into the system. In our cloud platform, we have to integrate it. And there are many, many other features like this. Okay, so long story short, we were not going to do a full migration to a cloud platform, but we are going with a hybrid setup. So that means on the one hand here on the left side, we really want to leverage the um, data foundation we have with the existing systems because these systems um, have its strength and we want to build on these, right? And we don't want to stop using that. On the other hand, as I said, we need something where we can enable these digital technologies that I was talking about, right? And that is like the right side of this um, uh, picture here. This is where we build like this Databricks-based cloud data platform, yeah? Okay, talking about this cloud data platform, um, we defined some design principles um, before we started uh, beginning of last year. Um, starting with the cloud native um, aspect, I think that's also um, something that I don't need to explain in detail here in this round. Just so much we were, um, we were looking for some technology that is really cloud native, right? So that means a true separation between storage and compute so that we can really scale the compute independently and with Databricks we found that. Um, by the way, the bold uh, points that I highlighted here are the ones that Nachman is going to show a little bit more in detail. Um, he will have some stars on his slides so that you can match these aspects to his architecture slides. So what he will show in the, in the um, cloud native area is like this feature of automated provisioning, deployment, and monitoring that we implemented with, with our cloud platform. The probably a little bit more uh, interesting um, piece is like the concept of workspaces we introduced. Like workspaces are for us logical um, spaces in our cloud platform where project teams or application teams can come in and can do their job without um, disturbing others in another workspace. And the entire idea of that is to keep the data gravity on our data platform so that we really avoid that someone needs to replicate the data to another warehouse, to another platform, to his application. But these guys can just do the job right on our platform in their workspace. And the interesting part that Nachman is also going to talk about is um, that we allow for a virtual consumption in these workspaces of our centrally managed data assets and that we call that shared data assets. The next part is the connectivity. Um, as I said, we are running in a hybrid setup, so therefore um, we need to ensure, um, given the n high number of uh, data assets that we are um, ingesting into our platform, we need 
a high level of automation. And um, we solved that by creating automated metadata driven ingestion pipelines with delta handling, so change data capture handling uh, included. Um, and on the other end, our consumers, um, of course, as I said, we in our on-prem systems, we had a lack of connectivity, so we overcame that with building our own API layer um, with different options, RESTful, GraphQL, and gRPC APIs directly based on Databricks. And the last point um, is security and compliance. Um, as you can imagine, when you have these 15 different enabling functions, you have to fulfill all kinds of compliance frameworks, all kinds of regulations in HR space, in finance space, whatever, right? You, you name it, everything. I think literally every compliance framework in the world, we have to fulfill it. Um, the point that Nachman is going to talk about is um, though the seamless authentication and authorization based on Azure Active Directory, which we introduced, which is um, a really nice feature because it is really seamless, right? Before we had silos uh, in terms of identities and identity providers, and now we overcame that, that we are really working with seamless identities and can apply a super cool overarching um, authentication authorization model. Okay, and with that, I will hand over to you, Nagman. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dieter. So, so Dieter kind of set the stage for, okay, why did we, did we even decide to journey in this direction with this, this new platform? One thing that Dieter kind of maybe touched upon and maybe you guys already caught it, when Dieter mentioned business warehouse, we are really using a lot of, I'll call it legacy technology. Yeah? It's based on Oracle, the HANA databases and this and that. Uh, plus we had a lot of data marts all over the world. Bayer is a large corporation. Any, any tool that you can think of, we probably own it <laughs> in, in the data space. So the idea was to try and consolidate some of these things and provide a platform that has, number one, the capacity to handle all of these different setups that we have across the globe. Remember the concept of workspace, and I'll get into that uh, in a minute. The second part, latency, in these warehouse, data mart, and even when you are doing, uh, uh, let's say, data science project, latency generally becomes an issue. So we paid extreme attention to that, to say, okay, if you're going to create something new, let's try and give them as fresh of, uh, let's say, uh, as fresh of a data set as we can. So let me start with, with a little bit of a start that I put in the ingestion, uh, ingestion side. Our default model is to try and stream the data in. I will not call it real time, because the minute you introduce something to, to do some sort of a data capture um, slash movement of data from the source, you've lost that true real time. My philosophy on real time is if you really, really need real time, go hit the source in one way or another. But of course, for a lot of these types of problems, warehousing or, or a data science type of a problem, you do have to move the data to some sort of a data platform, and that's exactly what we ended up doing. So we try and capture data as changes are happening in the system. Honestly, I could spend probably another hour talking about the kind of technology we've used, but if you're interested, send us a note or we can talk afterwards and I'll explain you that. We do do some batch processing also, depending on the source. But as I mentioned, let's start, our first thing is, is can we extract the data in near real time? As we move to the left, the rest of the setup looks very much like a warehouse, guys. I mean, this is nothing fancy here. Why did we do that? Because as Dieter explained, it's a hybrid architecture. We have lots of warehouses and data marks. Ultimately, over time, our goal will be to shift to this new platform. So right off the bat, we are preparing for that. So a lot of these slides that you see, landing, staging, discovery, and data assets are typical that you would find in any kind of a warehouse setup, but we did that in Databricks from the beginning. The interesting pieces for me in, in some of these are that may or may not be in a typical warehouse, this whole um, change data or, or, or uh, uh, change data part. I mean, we, we are processing that information right away into Databricks. So end to end, from ingestion to when it becomes a true asset in the farthest or far right side, it takes about 10 to 30 minutes because we do do a lot of transformations in the middle. Uh, Dieter already alluded to some. Uh, one key one is, is if you know, let's say, an SAP system, ERP system, they do a lot of currency shifting and all that. It just comes with the platform. Well, guess what? When you take data out, 
you have to implement that logic, and those transformations are fairly complex. We do that in our discovery zone. Another thing uh, Dieter already alluded to, we have a lot of compliance uh, topics that we had to cover. Our platform is fully what we call just compliant. It's, I believe, an internally used uh, bare term. But the point is, is we have to run every month a lot of compliance reporting to, to, to ensure to our auditors that the platform is operating within the, the bounds of what they have established. So that, that is part of our platform right off the bat. In the data access layer, uh, we have some interesting things going on, such as row level security, as well as uh, uh, we try and keep virtual um, access, meaning it's mostly views. And if there's some logic that we have to embed to do certain things, we try and do that there as well. Now, the, the, another star, which is the more interesting part of the setup, we try to automate as best as we could. Whatever we could, we try to automate from the beginning. To give you an example, um, for at least at the, at the moment, majority of our systems, all it takes is, is to add an entry into this configuration table uh, or metadata table, the name of the table. Rest of the stuff is uh, plus some other information as to what the source name is and so on and so forth, and the data starts flowing. What it does is, is it goes and reads the data dictionary of these source systems, figures out ah, table doesn't exist, automatically creates the table, and starts a schedule to start the initial load. So it is heavily metadata driven. And this was, again, by design, because we didn't want to get into, hey, now we have another system to connect to. We use that standard, let's say, um, templates slash operating procedure for these new sources that we connect to our system. Now, certainly, we do come across somewhere which is we have to tweak stuff or uh, create another, let's say, pattern. But we are slowly adding to that automation list because it's not just system. We extract, we, you know, we use, uh, we extract data through APIs. We have uh, some batch type of processing. But at least at a minimum, we are defining some standard templates to say, oh, let me go insert my code here. And guess what? We are use, heavily using notebooks in some of these instances where we say, oh, OK, we have a template defined. Uh, this source requires some additional tweaking. Let me go insert this special code for that. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, this gets a little bit uh, deeper into one of the un another interesting pieces that uh, Dieter talked about, or at least a couple of them. Let me start with the top part. Because of compliance requirements, you really have to be able to prove that you know, your users that are now uh, part of, let's say, bear ecosystem, if, if you add, subtract, you better be accurate that people who are gone now better not have access to the system. So we had to tie into, number one, some existing systems to be able to do that kind of reporting. I, I don't show those systems on here, but the key part in this is, is that we synced up our existing system to Active Directory, and that way our management of users and what they have access to gets translated into our Databricks system. That, in a way, really simplified, on one hand, our ability to do reporting and meet all of the compliance requirements. But of course, it does add some other complexities in terms of making sure all the systems are in sync and so on and so forth. The unique concept that we introduced, I think, um, at least I had not seen any other company talk about this, uh, this workspaces. To me, a workspace is an equivalent to a data mart, or it could even be a warehouse. That's the beauty of Databricks, in my opinion. You can make that workspace do whatever you want it to be. You have essentially all of the capabilities of a Databricks at your disposal. I'll tell you, I insisted that as we create these workspaces, we are going to give people autonomy. Because in the old world, if you have a warehouse, there's usually some large central team uh, taking requests in, and you know, weeks go by, and uh, then the guys uh, complain that, hey, all I asked was to go add a column or make a small change to a report. Guess what? In this model, we're not responsible. We give you, call it a self-service warehouse or a self-service data mart. Go do your own work. We allow them to load their local data sets. We expose all the core data sets that you alluded to. If you look at the data asset, this is where we are busy building pipelines. We bring the data in. We model it. Do add value add work, such as transformations that are required by really everyone. We take care of all of that. And then we hand off this workspace to you. You manage it. 
We give you some standard roles, like a read-only or a developer or, a, uh, let's say, an account admin for that. You go add, subtract users. Or if you need to create additional roles, you can do that on your own. So we give that ability to these individuals. And I can tell you they're pretty happy about being able to have freedom. Yet, this is a single platform. It's still compliant. We have visibility into who's doing what. Because often people will ask, hey, is the data properly masked in these workspaces and so on and so forth? We can easily check that if something, uh, let's say, that needed to be looked at. Um, with these workspaces, of course, there's a, you know, there's a little bit of a management piece that comes in. Initially, when requests come in, our team, the data engineering team, gets involved and sets up the workspace. But after that, the model for the most part is, is you're on your own. You build an ETL job or you create any new views, you load your data in, you're going to manage that. Just like in the old world, if they had a data mart sitting in some geographical location, the central team didn't really know about it. And oh, by the way, no matter how hard you would try to have the central model, people would still find ways if they felt like you were too slow. This model kind of balances that, in my opinion. You do some stuff centrally, and then let people really just go do their work. Um, the last part is, is we do provide very standard mechanisms. They can either come to, let's say, Dieter's team for some additional help around API, uh, because Dieter team will offer those services to them. Or they can tap into the setup that Dieter's team has already set up around, hey, this is how you expose APIs. So in a way, a lot of the teams that are shown in the workspaces are still connected to us. Sometimes they will come and ask us directly for help, or once we show them how to do it, then they're then they are pretty much on their own. Um, with that, uh, ah, okay, so I, I talked a lot about the workspaces because to me, this is really the key significant uh, part of our platform that we wanted to hand off ownership. Um, there's some responsibility that we shift to them because if they are responsible for the data sets that we expose, they better make sure that you know, they are also following those compliance policies. So we also have some procedures in place where we do our data handoff. It's kind of an official stuff that we make them uh, sort of sign to say, hey, now you're responsible. Uh, agility, I think, in this model, agility exists. Uh, Nobody is now relying on some central team to go simple tasks or even more complex tasks that they feel they, they are better suited to do that. Um, uh, Access management, as I already kind of explained, that it's a combination of, hey, we give you control, you, you manage that, and you're responsible. Uh, reusability of global data assets, and then uh, visibility, no silos. Nobody's now, in the, even in shadow IT to even IT team, you don't need to go provision another database, either in the cloud or on-prem type of a setup. You have a workspace. These workspaces, again, are uh, very powerful from a compute storage perspective. You have all of that at your disposal. Um, ah, by the way, the bottom part is interesting. With the Databricks model, those of you who have worked with it, generally it's a it's a single copy of data, mind you. It, it's sitting in in this in our case uh, Azure Data Lake Gen two storage. Uh, whatever is exposed from a global space, whatever variation of uh, view that we present to them, it is still operating on that same copy of data. If they store something locally, it's still going into that same gen, uh, in our same storage account. We don't, we don't, they're not provisioning their own storage account. So in a way, what I'm explaining is, is there's still a lot of control in this model, but it appears that they have complete freedom. That's the key uh, part in this setup. Okay, so current st stats, um, uh, we have already loaded about 360 terabyte. We started in January of this year. Uh, it took us about 12 months prior to that to set the stuff up, but really the data loading piece started uh, in January. And we have, uh, we have approximately 4,100 tables that we keep in sync. Mind you, any change that's happening in the system, it's synced up within 30 minutes, and that data is available in, in, in our system. We have over 30 source systems connected, and we have all kinds, from Oracle to HANA databases, Microsoft SQL, FTP servers, API, uh, and the list honestly keeps going. I just wrote a few just to give you an idea. So far, we have created 12 workspaces. Now, the interesting thing is, if we had not given them workspaces, 
I assure you, they would have found some way to go, go find a database somewhere and created some sort of an extract from these sources <laughs> because these teams are pretty, I mean, I don't blame it. They have to do their job. You can't blame them for that. Here, it's very streamlined. Give your workspace, you go do your work. Uh, we have, our size at the moment is about 186 VM machines. We are using L8s. And ah, there's another piece that our, our system is, um, is providing. It's nice to have people come and work and use that, let's say, central copy of data that you either loaded or are exposing. But there are occasions where you actually have to send data out. Um, data cannot just stay in one place. Examples are we have lots of uh, third-party applications where we have to send a data feed for those applications to work. So we've already started creating a lot of interfaces, but we have a very standardized way. We, we have a workspace, what we call global workspace. We expose all of our interfaces through that. The nice thing is, is that we can, uh, if somebody asks, what are your interfaces? You gotta go just look in that one workspace. And we control, of course, permission based on what interface is requesting uh, what, kind, what kind of data sets. Uh, I looked just recently, uh, in fact, I need to have our team kind of put this in a little bit more formal way. I did some random sampling to see exactly how many changes were we processing. So I took the five or six largest table, then I also took another six medium-sized table, and this, some bunch of small tables, five or six, and I counted the number of changes that were occurring per day. So it's around 100 million changes is what we process every day. Um, when I say large tables, really, Adira already alluded to that, it's in billions of records. Those tables are very large. Uh, medium size would be you know, anywhere from, let's say, 5 million to, I'll say, 100 million is our medium size. So that should give you an idea about how much processing we are doing every day. So, and latency is anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. Since the system is relatively new, I think there's room for improvement, mind you. My hope is, is that ultimately you should have this data be available in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. One thing I learned is, is that it's a, it's a balancing act. How much funds do you want to spend on shrinking that versus, okay, 30 minutes is good enough? Because it can be done, by the way. If you, that's another beauty of this, uh, working in the cloud. You have a lot of compute at your disposal, but then it comes that you gotta pay for it. Huh? So we're trying to find a little bit of a balance here to see what makes sense for Bayer. Uh, just a quick timeline. So we really started in November, December uh, 2022. We did some POC. Then um, uh, we put a request for funding. Uh, we signed a contract in April of 2021. Um, uh, and the successful deployment uh, of data pipeline happened somewhere in December. We were kind of done with our setup of our platform. So it did take from April to December to set all of this stuff up. Um, February, uh, compliance controls was lagging behind, so we worked on that. We signed a support contract with our partners uh, because now the uh, platform is production and so on and so forth. Ah, sorry, I forgot at the bottom. Uh, and I know I'm running out of time, so I, have, I do have some slides, but you, you get the idea that really from November, it took about uh, six to eight months of really high, you know, intense work to get this thing up and running. We initially struggled with some uh, resourcing challenges because this platform, I feel like, uh, does have a lot of knobs and dials that you can tweak using Databricks. So you really need to have people who know what they're doing. That was kind of the lesson learned. We had a little bit of a false start in the beginning. The resources that we had, we had to kind of reshuffle and really ask Databricks for help <laughs> uh, to get the right people in. And then things started to click after that point. Um, my other slide, some lessons learned. Uh, near real-time ingestion of mass transactional data is difficult, but not impossible. This, this uh, example or this uh, setup that I've shared with you, it's working. Uh, because think about it, with warehousing typically is always batch-based. And despite what somebody may say that, hey, batch-based is good enough for certain use cases, I would not argue with that. But really, uh, people, uh, companies, those who are working uh, in their day-to-day -day job, they really need to have the latest information uh, at, you know, that you can provide them. They're asking for it. And this platform really had, that's one of the things that we 
really kept at the forefront to say we are going to make a step change in that direction. And with this platform, I, I feel we've done that. Um, replication of our data from black box system is not trivial but possible. What I mean by that is, is a lot of the source systems that you deal with, it's not an easy feat to just start extracting data, especially in near real time. There's some engineering that's required, but again, it can be done. As I mentioned, we've connected to a lot of systems. And our philosophy is, is to try and bring near real-time data in. Uh, we, we, we are servicing all kinds of use cases with this. Data science, by the way, Databricks, I mean, I don't have to tell you that. It provides all the capability around data science. As with a workspace, you can create your notebooks, you, can, you have a choice of languages, you have access to the data now. So a lot of flexibility from that point of view. BI reporting, we are already marching in that direction. As you saw, yes, it's a hybrid architecture. We are not abandoning our existing warehouses, but over time, the hope is, is that this is our future home for these kinds of things as well. Uh, in data distribution, you saw we have interfaces. We are sending data out. Scalability and flexibility was definitely one of the reasons why we picked uh, Databricks. Uh, resourcing challenges, I already touched upon that. Make sure if you embark, especially if you're planning to embark on, on some sort of a you know, large project, I would say go right to those who know uh, this technology rather than perhaps working with vendors that you may have worked in the past. Make sure that they know they have the right skill set. Uh, CICD setup was another challenge because initially we started when we were building the platform, we set up all of our pipeline, but then now that the demand has grown to a point where we have really multiple teams working kind of independently. And we have to now break up our CICD pipeline so that teams are not blocking each other. So pay attention to that. We actually didn't, so now we have to do, redo some work. Uh, compliance, as I mentioned, Bayer is very, um, let's say, strict about compliance. So we, both Dieter and I, kind of underestimated that initially. So that's why instead of finishing everything by December, which is what the project timeline was initially, it did go into February. It took another couple of months to really um, let's say check all the boxes that we needed to for, from a compliance perspective. So with that, um, uh, we have one more slide, but I'm going to hand it off to Dieter so he can share with you exactly what we are planning uh, for the rest of this year and then in the future as well. Yeah, so I think as we are running out of time a little bit, I try to keep it really short. Um, I think that the most important point here is really the first one. It's like building a data modeling framework because, uh, I mean, what Nachman showed you, you see that most of the stuff we are currently doing is a replication of the data assets that we have in our existing systems, first and foremost, business warehouse, um, into the Databricks uh, platform. Um, but of course, uh, as Nachman also alluded to, we, are, we want to proceed and build data models from scratch in Databricks. And then there are many, many questions around that. What do you need to persist? Which intermediate steps? What can you do virtually in real time, right? So the, all these questions. Um, we are currently figuring out and we want to build like a data modeling framework to really build data assets in Databricks natively. Um, Attribute-based access, yes, we have some role-level security to a certain extent, but we want to have a full attribute-based access so that we can, yeah, that we have more flexibility in showing the data to consumers that they are really allowed to see. Um, also things like automatic source schema adaption if something changes in the source system. Currently, we have some monitoring uh, on that, but no automated uh, remediation of that issue, right? We wanna, wanna build on that. Um, another compliance framework, Nachman mentioned the JISC framework, which is our buyer interpretation of SOX. Um, we wanna go this year for GXP uh, qualification of the platform, and then self-service data asset consumption is also a topic that we wanna enable um, for end users for doing the self-service reporting stuff. And with that, um, we would like to close our talk. Thank you. Nachman and Dieter, thank you a lot for the presentation. Are there, maybe we might have time for one or two questions. One very, very good question. Just, just give me a second, I'll give you the mic. Thank you. A uh, quick question about SAP S4 HANA data, and uh, I think you are getting the data in there. So just wanted to see, like, you're doing transformation in the pipeline, or how are you keeping that data in sync? Because that's very tricky. Because it, it, all structure. the transformations are happening as data is coming in. It's on the fly, and the result set is getting stored. So the example, because I don't know how many of you are familiar with SAP 
um, how the application stores the data in the database. It shifts depending on the currency. So Japanese currency, they shift it to the left or something like that. But bear in bottom line, you got to multiply it with, with uh, 1,000 to get the real. <laughs> you do it on the fly. Exactly. Any third-party tool outside? Of, of, uh, yes, we are using some for the pipelining. Remember this extraction piece? There's a tool we are using. Uh, but rest of the, the, the transformation stuff, no. It's all coded in our notebooks using uh, PySpark and Python. Yeah? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your introduction. I actually allow your concept to separate the team uh, workspace for different teams. Say they, uh, each team, they can work on their uh, workspace. So my question is simple, say, do they, uh, for each team, do they have the enough the capability and the bills to, how to say, um, manage the workspace from themselves? Aha, uh -huh, good, okay, excellent question, by the way. Because in a way, look, um, you have to be careful. We do have a little bit of a process where I sit, sit down with them, kind of understand how capable are they. There are certain teams really do no doubt in my mind that they are off to the races because they, if, if they were managing a data mark, guess what? They have the skills and uh, the people to do that work, no problem. There are some on the other extreme. We've taken that, by the way, support for them. Uh, because we did the project, they came to us, uh, the, these are the early ones, and after the project was done, they're like, Nagma, now, um, sorry, but we don't wanna deal with it. I said, fine, we'll take it on. So we, we are taking those on. So those are two extremes. In the middle, people will often show up asking questions, and we, which we don't mind. We do play a consultant role for those types of things. But for the most part, I am pushing kind of the self-service warehouse. Hey, if you show up, I explain that. You're on your own, right? So. And, and maybe to mention, just to, to add on this, we also built like what we call a resourcing pool. So we have a contract with a supplier where we educate a pool of people on our platform, how to use it, naming conventions, all of that. And the, the projects can utilize these people. That's right. Um, for a short time, but also long term. So, but we ensure that they are trained on our platform and, and know how to do things, which is sometimes uh, also a good solution. Good. Dieter Nachmann, thank you very much. I know there are plenty more questions in the room, but I have to close down. Please directly go to the speakers. Feel free to do so. And I wish you a nice lunch break. Thanks a lot.